Bismillah ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulillah ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ve men temesseke bi sunnetihi ila yevmiddin. Ama ba'd, fa inna astakal hadithi kalamullah ve khayrul hadi hadiyu Muhammedin sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem. Ve şerral umuri muhdethatuha ve kulla muhdethatin bid'atin ve kulla bid'atin dolala ve kulla dolalatin finnar. So inşallah ta'ala we wanted to remind everyone inşallah that I can't do that now. Um, we wanted to remind everyone inshallah ta'ala uh, regarding our pre-Ramadan conference uh, that's going to be this coming Saturday inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah one of the things that we've done to alhamdulillah spice it up a little bit is that we have mashallah a wonderful donor who actually donated to us an Umrah package um, to be utilized as a giveaway, inshallah, during uh, the pre-Ramadan conference, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so alhamdulillah, for all who register, we are going to be giving that away, inshallah ta'ala, as a gift um, on behalf of that donor. Of course, from the conditions is that the people have to register, inshallah ta'ala. We're asking people to share it on uh, the conference information to share it on the social media tag three friends inshallah and then you have to be present at the conference in order to collect it once we announce it if not we go to the next name and then the last condition is that um, it can only be used uh, for the Umrah that is being done with Rebirth Reconnect when we have our Umrah trip inshallah ta'ala yeah. Um, along with that, inshallah ta'ala, um, for those who probably are going to ask for the video from last week, uh, it is currently being uploaded, inshallah ta'ala. I was hoping it would have been done by the time um, we got into class, uh, but unfortunately it wasn't because I wanted to share the link. Um, but inshallah ta'ala, we will share the link as soon as it finishes uploading, inshallah. And hopefully this class will get it uploaded much sooner uh, than we did uh, the last one. Um, another uh, personal ask, inshallah ta'ala, is that we try to keep the chat uh, to a minimal uh, in, during the class so that we don't get overwhelmed in the chat uh, or people start kind of uh, losing attention to what's being taught in the class um, in the chat. And then we can use at the end or towards the end the chat to be able to ask questions uh, and engage uh, back and forth with each other, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so with that, inshallah, we want to commence. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tamassaka bi sunnatihi ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. This is episode number two or class number two of Fiqh of Ramadan. Um, today, subhanallah, uh, which is a reminder for us all, uh, one of the purposes of this class is that we're looking, some, looking at some of the issues uh, of Ramadan and the fiqh of some of those issues, as well as we will be mixing it with uh, some tazkiyah, some uh, purification of the heart and soul um, in preparation for the month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, and those different uh, sciences, inshallah ta'ala, so that we can uh, get some benefit all together or around about benefit. Um, one of the reminders that I definitely want to give today, inshallah ta'ala, to everyone is that um, you know the month of Ramadan is only 20 or so days away and we even though we are looking forward to the month of Ramadan we have not been promised to get to the month of Ramadan and today was an awakening for me um, in regards to that um, a close friend a colleague, an imam, mashallah tabaraka wa ta'ala, um, Imam Yusuf, uh, Imam Yunus, I'm sorry, of Bega uh, Alta, Masjid al Farouk in Bega Alta, Puerto Rico. Um, someone who I've known for many years now, uh, probably close to a decade now, mashallah, uh, going back and forth to Puerto Rico, um, and him being involved in one of the biggest masjids in Puerto Rico in the da'wah and education of our brothers and sisters there. A really, mashallah, beautiful humble brother, mashallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala, um, who cared about the people, subhanAllah, and uh, cared about doing the work of da'wah, and loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and I'm sure he was waiting just like you and I to reach the beautiful month of Ramadan. And subhanAllah, this past Thursday, he suffered uh, a stroke uh, of which uh, he demised from. He did not survive, subhanAllah. Um, so we got the news today that they disconnected him from the machine because he was in a state of coma after that and he didn't survive when he was disconnected. So, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And for me, it was a blow. One, because he's not too much older than I am. We, I think we were pretty much close in age. Um, he was young, subhanAllah, to show that uh, death does, does not discriminate. Uh, it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your social status. It doesn't matter anything except that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has given everything its prescribed time. And when the prescribed time is up, then you return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why when we took that reminder last week um, that it doesn't matter when the day or the hour is going to be established as in that prophetic hadith. But what matters is what you have done to prepare for that hour. And many of us, we hope to make it to the month of Ramadan, just like Sheikh Yunus hoped to make it to the month of Ramadan. And we ask Allah, Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to reach the month of Ramadan. Ameen. But there are no guarantees that any of us will make it to the month of Ramadan. Some may, some may not. And because of that, we can't afford to wait until the month of Ramadan to be people who try to live righteous lives. We can't wait until the month of Ramadan to try to begin to transform our lives. We can't wait to until the month of Ramadan to say, okay, well, this is the month that perhaps maybe I'm going to finally change because no one is promising you that you are going to make it to Ramadan. And may Allah allow you uh, to make it to this Ramadan for the one who mentioned, mashallah, here on our TikTok live that it will be their first Ramadan. Uh, inshallah, reach out to us to, at Reverts Reconnect at MassNewYork.org. We are here to help you, inshallah, ta'ala. Imam Yunus, uh, mashallah, may Allah preserve him with the highest level of paradise and bless him with the highest level of paradise. He, subhanAllah, brother, just, and to show how sometimes you impact the lives of others and no one knows the impact that you're making on the face of the earth. And this is one of the things that we want to do. We want to be people who impact or leave an impact on the earth of good so that when Allah does take us, inshallah ta'ala, we leave in a good state. And subhanAllah, just, you know, one of my beloved brothers, he sent me a message on WhatsApp and he says, SubhanAllah, it was this Imam Yunus from Puerto Rico. And I said, yes. He says, the Nigerian African brother. And I said, yes. He says, Imam, I have to tell you a story. And, and I want to share this story with us, right? SubhanAllah, because it goes to show how, SubhanAllah, this man left good on the earth and we're finding out about it after his passing, SubhanAllah, and not before. Because he wasn't someone, as Allah says in the Quran, I don't look for uh, thanks, right, or praise, or I'm not looking for any return of wealth for what it is that we do. Um, he says, I met Imam Yunus on October 30th of 2020. He says, my father had passed away in Puerto Rico. He says, my father had, been, had to be prepared for the janaza and burial. Imam Yunus drove all the way from Vega Alta, Vega Alta to Guayanilla on the southwest part of the island about 25 minutes west of Ponce, which is almost a two, two and a half hour drive, okay? Just to kind of put things in perspective. Um, but what was so remarkable about the Imam is that his car broke down on the way, uh, all the way, uh, on the way uh, heading down, basically heading north. He said, did you know that uh, did you know he got his car towed and fixed and still drove to my father the same evening, right? Where my father was. 
he made it to the funeral home about an hour before the funeral home closed. So now you have to imagine this imam, he was called, informed that one of our brothers passed away, subhanAllah, and he gets in his car and he heads down there and he breaks down on the way. Anyone would have said, you know, brother, I'm sorry. I, I, it's no way I'm going to make it. You know, Uber in Puerto Rico doesn't function like Uber here, right? I have no way to get down from the north part of the island. He's in the extreme north. This is almost extreme south. Um, it's going to be too difficult for me, right? No, subhanAllah. He gets his tow, car towed to wherever it needed to get towed to. He fixed the car. Alhamdulillah, he jumps in the car. He continues driving down and he makes it to the funeral home one hour before it closed. He says, Imam Amjad, the Palestinian from Jauko and Ponce Masjid, called me to come to the funeral home. He says, when me and my son arrived, Imam Yunus was already there cleaning and washing my father, mashallah, tabarakallah. He says, subhanallah. So me and my son started washing the body as he, Imam Yunus, instructed us. He says, then after the ghusl, Imam Yunus wrapped my father and perfumed him. At the end of preparing my father for the burial, he said, I offered to pay him for all of his troubles. He said, or at least to pay him for some of the car repairs. But Imam Yunus refused to take the money from me. MashaAllah, Allahumma barik. He says, may Allah envelop him in his mercy and give him the highest level of paradise. al firdaus Ameen. So subhanAllah, we see that Allahu Akbar, um, this Imam, MashaAllah, he left an impact on this particular family, subhanAllah, to go out of his way to assure and help the family because he found it to be his duty, right? To be there for the Muslims when they pass away, to be there for their families, to be there for the deceased, to give them their rights. As the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned that from the rights of one Muslim to another, right, is the following of the janazah and for the Imam, it, the right the Muslim deceased has upon us is that we show up to make sure that we wash him appropriately, inshallah ta'ala, our brothers are showing up to wash him appropriately so that, mashallah, we give him the best, right, on his way out or on her way out, subhanAllah. So this Imam, subhanAllah, who really focused on impacting hearts, souls, and minds, you know, who probably wished to get, mashallah, tabarak wa ta'ala, to Ramadan, did not make it. Not only that, subhanAllah, he was someone finishing up his doctor's degree uh, to become a medical doctor, which he was working on for a long time and hard. MashaAllah, I heard he had just passed his boards, subhanAllah, and that he was just waiting for his certifications and his licenses so that he can start working in the field, subhanAllah, because he wanted to be a person who helped human beings out in the field of medicine as well. And alhamdulillah, he was already working in the field, um, but you know, he didn't get to achieve receiving his certifications and his licenses. And may Allah tabarak wa ta'ala reward him sincerely for all of his intention um, and greatly for Allah reward him greatly for all of his intentions and allow him to see that when he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is a reminder for all of you that the time is now. This morning, alhamdulillah, I was blessed to do a podcast um, and you guys will see it come out, inshallah ta'ala, during the month of Ramadan. I'm not going to say with whom it was right now at the moment, inshallah ta'ala, or on what uh, method. But when it comes out, we'll put it out, inshallah ta'ala. But one of the ayats that uh, one of the mashaykh focused on in this podcast um, was the verse in the Qur'an where Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he says, Alayhi bi kafin abda. He says, is Allah not sufficient enough for his servant? Right? Is Allah not sufficient enough for his servant? SubhanAllah. And Allah continues in the uh, following verses where he says, um, Yet they threaten you with other powerless gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever Allah leaves to stray will be left with no guide. And whoever Allah guides... None can lead astray. Is Allah not almighty capable of punishment? And Ibn Kathir, he says that subhanAllah, one of the meanings of these verses, inshallah ta'ala, this is verse 36 and 37, 
He says that whoever relies on him subhanahu wa ta'ala and turns to him, that individual will never ever be forsaken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That individual will never ever be forsaken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have to ask ourselves that question before the month of Ramadan approaches. Ali sallallahu bikafin abda. Is Allah not sufficient enough for us? Is it not time, right? As Allah says in the Quran, has the time not yet come, right? So that the believers' hearts, right? SubhanAllah can submit to Allah so that the believers' hearts can tremble, right? SubhanAllah at right the recitation of the Quran so that the believers' hearts can fall into complete submission so that the believers' hearts right are completely dedicating themselves to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala obeying him subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah not enough for us and if we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for us then that means that during times of hardship he is enough during times of trial he is enough during times of sadness and sorrow he is enough that even during times of happiness and wealth and having everything that we want we also have to make sure that he is enough meaning what meaning that when we don't have that we know that alhamdulillah we have him but that when we are full and have so many things that we don't get allow ourselves to become distracted right Showing him that he is enough for us and we can't, we won't get lost in these different things, right? SubhanAllah. And we have to really prepare and ask ourselves this question, is Allah not sufficient for us? And begin to really prove to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is sufficient for us. That we are willing to, mashallah, show him that he is sufficient for us. So that inshallah ta'ala, we can never, so that we will never be forsaken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because we have never forsaken Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says in the Quran, that on the day of judgment, he is going to raise some individuals up, up blind. And that they will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, why have you raised me blind when in the world I was able to see? And Allah will say to them, this day I have forgotten you just like you had forgotten me. So we have to ask ourselves, have we forgotten Allah? And if we have, then it's time to be begin remembering Allah. It's time to find Allah. It's time to find ourselves so that inshallah ta'ala we allow Allah to be in our lives because Allah has not removed himself from us, but rather we have removed ourselves from him. And when we return back to him and we turn towards him, then he subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn towards us and he will return, will return back to us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that be the case for all of us, for you, your families, for us and our families, and that Allah never forsake us, that Allah never forget us, and that we and, and that, that is because we have never forgotten and forsaken Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that beautiful verse in the Quran, Rabbana la tuzikulubana ba'dad hadaytana wa hablana min ladun ka rahma inna ka anta wahhab. We ask you, O oh our Lord. Do not allow our hearts to stray after you have guided them. We ask you, Allah, Allah, to keep our feet planted and firm upon faith. We ask you, Allah, to make you sufficient for us in our lives with everything that we have. And that we show appreciation in those good times and in those bad times. So that is our section, inshallah ta'ala, of Tazkiyah for now our heart softeners and our heart purifications. And then we'll move on now um, back to where we left off in terms of the fiqh of worship, inshallah. If absolutely necessary, um, if 
if you have to write a question because it's absolutely necessary and you don't want to forget it as we're going through, um, no worries. Uh, but probably uh, it's better to, um, once you ask it, uh, for someone else not to respond back to that question, right? So that there's no back and forth in the chat between uh, individuals in Shalta. So let individuals ask their questions. Let the questions remain in the chat as because sometimes, mashallah, the question may come up as the lesson is coming up. Um, but let's not respond back to that question. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll respond back to that question at the end of uh, the lesson, inshallah. So that way there's no back and forth in the chat between uh, individuals, inshallah. Okay? Barakallah fiqh. So we left off last week, um, or uh, yeah, last week, talking about those who are exempt uh, from fasting. And we mentioned that breaking the fast is permissible for four types of individuals, four types of people. That the first person is an ill person or a sick person who will be harmed because of fasting, right? And we talked about that having two categories as well. The person who is ill, but they will recuperate from their illness uh, by taking medicine, then that person naturally, they don't have to fast um, during their sickness. Uh, but once their sickness, uh, once they are returned back to health, then at that moment, inshallah ta'ala, they will make up whatever they missed during the month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. For the person who has an ongoing sickness that will never go away, then we mentioned that they will feed a poor person for every day in the month of Ramadan. And then he mentioned the traveler who is permitted to also shorten their prayer, meaning the one who has traveled a far enough distance, inshallah ta'ala, where they can shorten and combine their prayers, that they have the ability to fast or not to fast, right? Remember, we took the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu said, righteousness, right, um, isn't to uh, like to, to, to force yourself to do these different types of things, right? SubhanAllah. Um, So righteousness isn't, the Prophet said, it's not righteous that you fast while you're traveling. That's the correct hadith. It is not righteousness that you fast while you're traveling. Um, and this hadith is related in Bukhari. Um, so again, you have the option of fasting and you have the option of breaking your fast. And neither one of those two, two things um, make you seem stronger or weaker, right? It's not a stronger position of I'm going to fast because... Alhamdulillah, I need to do this. It's the month of Ramadan. You have the ability not to fast, right? The Prophet ﷺ has given you that ability, inshallah ta'ala. You can take it, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah wa ta'ala is not going to look at you any different, inshallah ta'ala. Especially if you are traveling out in the sun, traveling long distances, and you're going to get weak, tired, sleepy, fall asleep behind the wheel, right? You need to be responsible and take care of yourself and make sure these things don't happen and that you don't harm yourself. You can break your fast or you can try to fast and if, if it seems like it's too much, then you can break your fast because you fall under that condition of permissibility and then you can make those days up later, inshallah ta'ala, after the month of Ramadan. Um, the second we mentioned was the menstruating women, the woman who had her mens, uh, and then also the one suffering from postpartum bleeding. Postpartum bleeding is after they have delivered their child, uh, that they have days that they are still bleeding, um, then those days they are not permitted to fast uh, or pray, right? Um, and they would make up those days, inshallah ta'ala, afterwards. A pregnant woman who is breastfeeding, we talked about this, inshallah ta'ala, as well. And basically, the scholars have stated, again, um, there's choice here. Um, and the best option, as we mentioned last week, is to uh, go to your doctor, seek a medical opinion from your doctor who is dealing with you and your health so that you make sure that you are putting your health first and the health of your child first inshallah um, ta'ala and if uh, the doctor says you can fast then no worries you go ahead and you can fast inshallah ta'ala if the doctor says that it will be harmful for you and harmful for your child and or either one then you can make up your fast after inshallah ta'ala and then here, he had brought up a position, inshallah ta'ala, um, as there's different positions. Um, you know, the majority position is that if she breaks her fast out of fear for herself, 
she makes up for it only, right? So this is the majority position within the, most of the schools. So all of the schools, Ahmed, uh, the Hanafis, the Hanbalis, the Malikis, and the Shafis, they say all of them, if she breaks her fast out of fear, then she only makes up for the fasting, inshallah, meaning she makes up those days that she missed, okay? Um, there's another opinion that says if she breaks her fast out of fear for her unborn child only, she makes up for it and also feeds one poor individual for each day that she did not fast. But then the Shaykh said there's a hadith, according to Ibn Abbas, in all cases that the pregnant woman or the nursing woman only needs to feed one person for each day of Ramadan that she did not fast and she does not have to make up for those days. And this can be found in Ad-Dar al-Qutani. And he basically mentioned that this latter opinion of her having to just feed is something that may be a kinder, more lenient position for women, right? Because the pregnancy lasts a long time. There may be recurrent pregnancies. After the pregnancy, she may start to breastfeed automatically or right away. That breastfeeding can be for the period of two years. Now you see that if she's held off, that's three years of fasting. That's three months of fasting. It's building up um, and it may be difficult for her to make those days up. So the lenient position here would be um, to basically feed a poor person for every day of fasting, 30 poor people for 30 days of fasting, inshallah ta'ala. And there is that narration that would give you the permissibility to do so, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala, he knows best, okay? Um, then he mentions the fourth type of person is the person, which we didn't discuss last week, is the person who is incapable of fasting because of old age, and we mentioned earlier the incurable disease. So he separates this person with sickness, and he separates the incurable disease into two separate categories, okay? He places one in each one in its own category. So old age, naturally we know that old people may have difficulties, or there may be uh, people that suffer from diabetes and all other types of uh, illnesses, that it would make it dangerous for them to fast throughout the day and not take their meds. So they are given the permissibility of not having to fast, inshallah ta'ala, and they can feed one poor person for every day of fasting, inshallah ta'ala. And then he talks about, as for the rest of those who break their fast, now everyone outside of that those four categories, okay? So as for the rest of them, or the rest of the individuals and people who break their fast, inshallah ta'ala, they only need to make up those days that they have broken their fast. He says, except for someone who has broken his fast by having intercourse with their spouse, okay? He says, in this case, he must make up for it. And free a slave, if he cannot do that, he should fast two consecutive months. If he cannot do that, he should fast 60, uh, he should feed 60 individuals. If he cannot do that, then the burden is lifted from them. And this is based on a hadith that is agreed upon, found in Bukhari and Muslim, where a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, I am doomed. The Prophet asked why. He said, I had intercourse with my wife in Ramadan. The Prophet said, then free a slave, the first Thing that would have to be done. He says, I can't afford it, Ya Rasulullah. He says, then fast two consecutive months, meaning fast for 60 days. He says, I cannot do that. It's too difficult on me, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet said, then feed 60 poor people. And the man said, I cannot afford it. I don't have the money basically to feed 60 poor people. Then a large container of dates was brought to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, where is the one, meaning the man, who was asking that question? He answered, Here I am, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ told him, Take these dates and give them in charity, right? So that you can feed those 60 poor people, basically. The man said, Ya Rasulullah, is there anyone more needy than us? Is there anyone more needy than us? And the messenger, he said, I swear by him who sent you with the truth, there is no household between the two lava hills in Al Madinah that is needier than my household. And the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he smiled until you could see his canine teeth. And then he said to him, Then these dates are for you. Okay, subhanAllah. So we see that the person who breaks their fast because of having 
relations with their spouse, um, it's a serious, uh, 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 right? It's a serious uh, act during the month of Ramadan that's not to be done. You're supposed to stay away from your lust, from your desires, from food, from drink, from all of these things during that time that you're supposed to be fasting, inshallah ta'ala. And because it is a serious, uh, because it is serious um, violation, then you have to expiate for that violation. Okay, so again, the first would be freeing a slave. We don't have slaves nowadays, so that would not be the case. The second is to fast for 60 days. If the person for some reason feels that they are not going to be able to fast for 60 days consecutively, then they are to feed 60 people, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and if they cannot feed 60 individuals, that means that they are extremely poor, right? That they are in need of charity more than anyone else. Then they themselves can take that charity for themselves. And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala waves it off. But we have to be careful because we are human beings. And human beings, we often say, mm, well, maybe that's my case, right? Inshallah ta'ala. We have to really... Uh, analyze is that your case is that the case for real that you are that poor that you can't feed 60 people is it your case for real that you can't fast the 60 days right these are all expiations for the penalty or penalties right for the, the for violation of what you're supposed to be doing and holding on to during the month of Ramadan um, so inshallah ta'ala you would have to analyze that yourself see what you're capable of and what you're not capable of and the best above all of this is to just not commit the act itself and not violate uh, the principles so that you don't have to expiate in the month of Ramadan because again part of the month is to remove yourself away from desires and things of this nature and then they ask the question if he had intercourse and did not expiate before he had intercourse again meaning the person um, ended up doing it twice right subhanallah I did it once, then I did it again. Perhaps on the same day, perhaps on another day. Then he says, uh, if he expiated and, and had intercourse a second time, then a second expiation is mandatory upon him. Meaning, he would have to fast another 60 days, that would be right, 120 days, um, and feed or feed another 60 people, 120 people, and the likes, inshallah ta'ala, right? So you're just basically doubling on um, what you have already uh, added to yourself, inshallah ta'ala. So again, it is better to just stay away from uh, the intercourse in self during the month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, outside of that hour of fasting. Outside of that, within that hour of fasting, outside of that hour of fasting, then you and your spouse can be with each other as you like, um, inshallah ta'ala. One of the things that they talk about, um, just out of respect for Ramadan and respect for those individuals who are fasting, that even those individuals who uh, qualify or it's permissible for them to break their fast, that they should try their best not to like eat out in public, inshallah ta'ala, um, eat out in, fr in front of other people, inshallah ta'ala, just to kind of refrain from, uh, you know, making it difficult on someone else, people looking down upon you because maybe they don't understand that you, mashallah tabarakah wa ta'ala, are exempt in that moment, inshallah ta'ala, and just, um, you know, out of respect for the month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. Then he brings up the, the, the issue of if fasting can be made up for, for a person who died um, and died while still owing uh, some fasting days, inshallah ta'ala, um, and they discuss the issue of whether it was with an excuse or without an excuse, and he says that one poor person should be in the, he says if it was without excuse, then one poor individual should be fed per day on his behalf, unless the obligatory fasting was because of a vow, in which case someone should fast on his behalf. So there's, uh, you know, a debate on whether uh, someone can fast on the behalf or not. Um, and they say the majority of the scholars, they state that the obligatory fasting in Ramadan is just like the obligatory salat. Um, that it cannot be done on behalf of someone else. This is because of the reports from Ibn Umar and Ibn Abbas, in which they said no one may pray on behalf of someone else, and no one may fast on behalf of someone else. Um, but then 
you know, saying if it if it was a vow um, that was made in Ta'ala as Allah Tabarak wa Taala as, as there's another hadith uh, in Muslim and and and, and uh, Bukhari that whoever dies while owing some fasting to Allah, let his responsible heirs fast on his behalf. So they said it is recommended for the responsible heir to make up only the vowed fast on behalf of the deceased. So this, that's where the difference is. If it is a fast that was vowed for, right, a vow was made for, or if it was not fast that was not a vow made for, inshallah ta'ala. We move on to the chapters that uh, invalidate, the things that invalidate the fasting, inshallah ta'ala. So what breaks the fast? And then here he's going to get into some of the medical issues as well, inshallah ta'ala. So number one, of course, eating and drinking of any type breaks your fast. The consum consumption of anything breaks your fast, inshallah ta'ala. Number two, taking anything into his throat and or nostrils. And here, this means, again, he gives the hadith that is found in the uh, 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 Ibn, uh, Abu Dawood uh, and uh, authenticated by Sheikh Al-Albani where he says sniff water far into your nostrils unless you are fasting right unless you are fasting do not mean when you are making wudu you know you have to sniff water and then blow it out that we wouldn't sniff it as far as that it would now go down and into our throat and break our fast inshallah ta'ala okay so we would sniff it enough that uh, we are not swallowing it. The same thing with putting water into our mouth, swishing it around inside the mouth, inshallah ta'ala, and spit, spitting it back out so that it does not go down into the throat. I know one of the questions that is always asked is, can I taste my food during the month of Ramadan for a person who actually may work in the field as a chef? Uh, can I taste the food? Because if I don't taste the food, then I don't know if it's too salty, if it's not salty enough, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they say that, yes, the person can taste the food, but again, without swallowing that saliva and the likes, right? Tastes it and then spits it out, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and then when he talks about here, taking anything through any other routes, he starts talking about here um, the medical care. Uh, it puts it on the medical care and fasting, right? So he says that in the madhab, anything that reaches the jawf or the cavity, here it refers to the abdominal and cranial cavities through any orifices, including the eyes, if he finds it, its taste in his throat, ears, they said if the fluid goes into the cranial cavity, anus, vagina, if it is liquid, or even a penetrating wound, would nullify the fast. Also, if he allows someone to cause a penetrating wound into his abdomen and the instrument reaches its cavity, his fast would be invalid. This means that in addition to, to that, endoscopy, colonoscopy, uh, laparoscop laparoscopic surgery would also nullify the fast. And he says the only orifice accepted from the above is the male urethra. And also the vagina is an exception if non-disintegratable items were introduced into it and it didn't reach beyond that. So then here he begins to talk about uh, other medical items such as injections. So injections, he says here, that are uh, nutritious types of injections. He says they do not valid invalidate the fast according to the IIFA. And this is a fatwa committee. Okay, They do not invalidate the fast injections other than nutritious ones. Uh, uh, nutritious injections invalidate the fast. Non-nutritious injections do not invalidate the fast. Okay, correction. So non-nutritious injections do not validate the, invalidate the fast and nutritious injections invalidate the fast. Okay. Um, enemas, he says, are controversial um, and basically the Fatal Committee deferred the discussion on them. But many contemporary scholars have allowed enemas while fasting because even though they reach the hollow of the interior of the body, they do so from a route that it is not natural for food or drink, right? Um, and it is not even close to this natural route, right? So meaning the enemas is not a natural source to give nutrients to the body. So some of the scholars have allowed it because of that. Vaginal suppositories and douches, they do not break the fast according to this fatwa committee as well. Urinary catheterization, 
including the placement of dyes. He says this also does not break the fast, according to this festival committee. Sublingual tablets, right? These are basically tablets that you put into your mouth, on your tongue, and they dissipate or they disappear, right? Dissolve on your tongue without you having to swallow them. He says if it dissolves on your tongue, right, then that goes into or it is absorbed by the mucous membrane of the mouth and it doesn't reach the interior part of the body. So that does not invalidate the fast as long as you avoid swallowing them, inshallah ta'ala. He says inhalers and nasal sprays. He says the permanent fatwa committee in Saudi Arabia ruled that they do not invalidate the fast, but it is a matter that is still controversial, right? Inhalers and nasal sprays, okay? Nasal drops are controversial. The scholars who say that they invalidate the fast support their view with the previous hadith about swift sif, sniffing water into the nostrils. And the scholars who argue that they do not break the fast maintain that even if a small amount made it to the stomach, it would still be negligible, meaning it's not enough to provide any types of nutrients, inshallah ta'ala. So the fatwa committee maintains that as long as the patient avoids swallowing them, there should be no harm for the patient to use the nasal drops, inshallah ta'ala. Eye drops and ear drops, they do not invalidate one's fasting according to the fatwa committee. And many scholars, particularly ear drops, uh, they say because there is no connection between the external ear and the interior of the body, except in the case of perforation of the eardrum. And then what might reach the hollow interior of the body would be, again, extremely negligible, not sufficient enough. Endoscopes, endoscopes. He says, even if they enter through the mouth, they do not break the fast, according to the Fatwa Committee, because they are not nutritious and they do not remain in the abdomen. The majority of earlier scholars will consider them as invalidators because they enter the hollow interior of the body. He says, number six, uh, the next one he says, are skin preparations that are absorbed by the, by the body. He says, these also do not invalidate the fast according to to the Fatwa Committee and the vast majority of contemporary scholars. Dental procedures, they do not break the fast, again, according to the Fatwa Committee, as long as one tries not to swallow any of the liquids. It would certainly be preferable to defer elective procedures until after Ramadan so as to not make a mistake. Laparoscopic surgeries, they do not break the fast, again, according to the Fatwa Committee, inshallah ta'ala. Blood donation also does not break the fast. Other invalidators of the fast is when one vomits intentionally. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, in a hadith from Abu Huraira in a Tirmidhi, he who is overwhelmed by vomiting does not have to make up the fast, but he who intentionally vomits must make up his fast. Okay? So the one who intentionally vomits has to make up the fast, but the one who does not intentionally vomit or is overwhelmed by vomiting, does not have to make up the fast, okay? And I'm sure that's a question that many people also wonder, inshallah, during the month of Ramadan. Um, number five of the things that invalidate the fast is masturbation. Or both the men and the women, again, Allah, uh, Abu Hurairah, anhu, from an hadith related by Abu Hari and Muslim, he says that he gives up his sexual desires, food, and drink for me. So he mentions here sexual desires, lusts, right, all of these things, right, masturbation is included into that category, inshallah ta'ala. Number six, uh, here he includes the scholar, uh, which is also um, a point of debate, uh, and there's difference of opinion. He says, kissing or touching the opposite gender, and subsequently ejaculation, semen, or has mevi because of it. So semen is the white substance that comes out, right? Mevi is the clear substance that comes out. So Mevi is the substance that comes out before ejaculation. So it is the pre-ejaculation, which is clear, and the ejaculation is the one that is white. Here, but there's a difference of opinion here. So he says, in the case of ejaculation of semen, the four schools of thought, they all agree that it breaks the fast. But in the case of Mevi or pre-ejaculation, then this remains to be a issue that is controversial, okay? It is an issue that is controversial. And then he gives the different opinions. Here, the Hanbalis, they say the fast becomes invalid. A smaller position within the Hanbalis and the position within the Shafi state, it does not break the fast since the Prophet ﷺ allowed touching and kissing, and this is not infrequent 
uh, this is not infrequently associated with Nadi, the pre-ejaculation. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ would kiss his wives upon leaving the house, inshallah, as well. Um, and then you have uh, some Hanbalis, Shafis, and Malikis who say, if he looks at a woman more than once and consequently ejaculates semen, not Mehdi, his fasting is invalidated. Okay. Um, and then he said, note that intercourse wasn't mentioned here with the nullifiers um, because he addressed it separately uh, in the previous chapter, as we talked about in the previous chapter, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. So you have those two different positions, and it seems like the stronger position is that only if ejaculation uh, comes out from that action of kissing or whatever have you, then that's when the fast is broken. But if it's pre-ejaculation, then the fast is not broken, inshallah. Um, number seven, he mentions hijama. Hijama is wet cupping, right? Or as they say, bloodletting, where now they cut you and they put the cups and they're extra extracting the blood from your body, inshallah ta'ala. He says the one who has it done to them or the one who does it uh, to someone else. And again, this is also a point of uh, debate, inshallah ta'ala, in terms of uh, contention. There's not an agreement on this, inshallah ta'ala. And he says, and this is intentionally, and while remembering that he is fasting, and for all of the above, the fasting is nullified. Okay, so this agreement here, uh, in terms of bloodletting, um, he says the position of the Hanbalis, the majority, uh, uh, this is the, that is the position of the Hanbalis, that it breaks the fast. The position of the major, majority, the Hanafis, the Malikis, and the Shafi'is do not consider hijama to break one's fast. Okay, so the majority say no, and the Hanbalis are the only ones that say that it breaks the fast, inshallah ta'ala. And of course, they both have uh, their proof, inshallah ta'ala. He goes into the issue of eating if one um, eats by mistake, right? As we mentioned, that I think, last week as well, then um, it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that does not break the fast. And he gives the hadith from Abu Huraira that is recorded in Bukhari Muslim, he who forgets while fasting and eats or drinks, then let him finish his fasting, for it is Allah the Almighty who gave him food and drink, okay? So you don't have to break your fast uh, if you made that mistake this was something by error all of a sudden you find yourself you take a sip alhamdulillah and then you're like oh subhanallah i'm fasting you can still continue with your fasting inshallah ta'ala and he said the same would apply to anyone who was made to break their fast under compulsion and we know that like the people the brothers and sisters in china were going through this where they were making them eat and stuff during the day and were not allowing them to fast during the month of ramadan since it was not their intention to break their fast, their fast is not broken, inshallah ta'ala. And he says, according to the Madhab, this does not apply to the one who has had uh, intercourse without remembering that it is a day in Ramadan. So intercourse is removed from this category, right? SubhanAllah. To show how the scholars, mashallah, have thought about everything, this is just in relations to eating and drinking. It has nothing to do with intercourse, whether you forgot and you had intercourse, that's not included, you still have to expiate for that, inshallah ta'ala, okay? Coming to an end, inshallah ta'ala, he says, uh, acts that do not invalidate the fast, okay? If a fly flies into your mouth by mistake, dust flies into one's mouth by mistake, one rinses the mouth and sniffs water into the nostrils and the water reaches the far pharynx or the back of the throat, inshallah ta'ala, he says, and again, this is by accident, it does not invalidate your fast. If one thinks about sex and ejaculates, he says, this does not invalidate the fast or injects liquid into his urethra or he has a wet dream or is overwhelmed by vomiting. His fast is not nullified, inshallah ta'ala. He says, none of these break the fast because he did not intend to break his fast. He did not do anything wrong. And he did not do anything that would probably result in the invalidation of his fast, okay? Um, if it was something that he intended to do, uh, and then that is something that is different. So checking the intention is always super important, inshallah, when it relates to these things, inshallah ta'ala. We have reached our hour mark, inshallah. So we'll take a pause there, and we'll open up the floor for uh, questions and answers. 
uh, for tonight, inshallah. May Allah reward you all. Ameen.